Good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. We are here today again with uh, Ramendra Ji, and this time we have with us uh, his wife, uh, Madhvi Ji, as well. Um, about, I think about nine months back last year in March 2022, we spoke with uh, Ramendra Ji about his colon cancer and the initial diagnosis, etc. And um, he was still to have his surgeries at that time. I think his surgeries were scheduled a couple of days later. Uh, today, he's back to tell us how life has changed for him over the last few months. And as I said, we're also very privileged to have with us uh, Madhvi Ji, who has, uh, we will find out, I think, as we talk today uh, about her role and how she has, uh, uh, you know, become such an educated and not an educated, but an informed caregiver uh, as well. Um, and I'd like to quickly just remind our audience that, you know, Patients Engage is an online platform that helps patients and caregivers share their personal experiences and learn from each other. And the whole idea is that the information you get from this allows you to, uh, you know, make important decisions uh, in a better and more informed way. And also for us to realize that we are not alone. Uh, one of the things I think that struck me when we announced this webinar today uh, was, uh, you know, how many people came back and told us that of somebody, a relative who refused to go in for a stoma bag and, uh, you know, and, you know, kind of later regretted it or uh, by then it was too late, etc. So that's why we felt that this was a very important discussion to have. We've always put uh, webinars, uh, you know, patients and survivors at the center of our discussions. Uh, and we've been doing it for the last uh, almost now 10 years. Uh, we've talked of different aspects of uh, living with a condition, especially with cancer. We've talked of relationships, you know, how it affects uh, uh, children, how it affects spouses, how it affects uh, parents, etc. So, uh, and we've talked of issues which typically, you know, people don't like to talk about. Uh, so, I won't take up too much time because I think what we will gain from this conversation is much more uh, important. Uh, so thank you once again, Ramindra Ji and Madhvi Ji for joining us today. Um, let Can I ask both of you to introduce yourself in a sentence? Okay. <laughs> let me try. So I'm a writer by passion, a storyteller by obsession, a dancer by inspiration, a perfect husband to a beautiful, gorgeous lady by aspiration, and now a cancer warrior by determination. Right. Sentence was so long, so let me <laughs> cut it short. <laughs> so in one sentence, I am his wife and caregiver. <laughs> no, but you have a life beyond that, right? So tell yeah, us a little bit about that. Definitely, <laughs> but I can't put it in one sentence. I don't want to take form two. Such You're a allowed sentence. to take two since he took so many <laughs> words. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So, yeah, so I think um, as as you will find out from the conversation and I think what uh, Ramindra Ji shared with us last time as well is that both of them, you know, had uh, uh, senior corporate jobs and had, uh, you know, I think just about taken early retirement. Uh, so, Ramindra Ji, tell us quickly when you were diagnosed and the various treatments you went through, uh, you know, including the stoma surgeries. Like you mentioned, we took voluntary retirement in August 2020 from our corporate jobs in Dorkila Street Plant. And we shifted to Bangalore in January 2021. So for the first 10 months, life was a blast for both of us. We were doing what we enjoy most. I was following my passion, which is writing, storytelling, and you know, generally having a great time. And Madhvi was following her passion, that is improving me, which is a continuous process. On November 29th, I was slammed with the cancer verdict. I had gone to my gastro, uh, uh, you know, because I was suffering from uh, slight or what I thought were slight issues of indigestion. The verdict came out to us that I was suffering from colon cancer stage 2B. Mm. So after that, I uh, underwent uh, five rounds of radiation, uh, five rounds of uh, chemo, a major surgery uh, on 17th March which went off really, really well, though it was a six-hour, seven-hour surgery. 
but uh, in which my cologne was uh, removed i was uh, decolonized hmm. uh, but the reconnecting surgery which happened on 6th april went completely completely haywire i suffered from three septic shocks two more surgeries i was in the icu for 40 days i lost 17 kg and uh, you know came back literally from the uh, land of the death to the land of the living three times because the probability of survival of one septic shock as you would know is uh, just around 20 to 30% right so after all this oil i'm sitting here and talking to you right so when did you come i and, and i know so just for the audience uh, ramindra ji has shared his experience with the septic shock uh, on the website as a blog uh, and that's a whole separate discussion so we will probably set up another time to talk about it uh, but coming back to when the you know when he was discharged uh, uh, madhvi ji you know what did you know about okay let's start with what did you know about colon cancer when he was first diagnosed and then when he uh, i think the expectation was that he would not need a stoma bag for very long uh, so how did you you know figure that out what it meant what it meant the first time and what it meant the second time so if you can just talk us through that knowing about colon cancer i think i knew nothing neither did he i mean he just went to the gastroenterologist just thinking that it's a minor digestion problem hmm. and everything would be set right but then of course uh, like he said it was uh, the verdict was very bad and after that uh, we were told that between the his decolonization and the reconnecting surgery the stoma bag would be there only for a very short uh, period like mm. once the wound heals they would do the reconnecting surgery right. and that's it that would be the end of the stoma bag so once the stoma was put it was pretty gross and you know it was very difficult for uh, him as well as me to you know accept it it was mm. really really very very repulsive and very very gross right. but uh, then we just kept uh, you know counsel i mean telling each other that it's it's only a matter of a few weeks maybe 2 mm. 3 weeks and all so after the surgery on 17th march he had a check up on uh, 5th of april and then the doctor said that uh, his wound has really healed well and uh, if you want we can go in for the reconnecting surgery tomorrow mm. so that was such an encouraging thing and we said okay fine if you think everything is gone well then we should go in for the reconnecting surgery so that very day in the afternoon we admitted him again to the hospital they did all tests and the next day morning the reconnecting surgery was done so mm. after that it seems sometimes it takes around 4 to 10 days for the motility of the intestine to start right in his case uh, there was no sign of it starting mm. so then again they did a ct scan with uh, injecting some dye and everything happened and all so on the uh, i think it was on the 11th 11th april night the motions you know just sort of started and mm. again for a number of hours there was nothing and then on 12 like the night of 12th was very 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 bad very bad right. he just kept on passing one motion after the other and he was not conscious also because they had given him some kind of a sedative and he was totally you know i mean drugged also drowsy right. and drugged and he didn't know right. what was happening Right. so after that during that time he lost a lot of fluids so he suddenly went into some kind of delusions and he was pulling at his iv and he was pulling at his clothes and all that and anyway the next day morning the doctor shifted him to the icu right and right. we said okay fine it might be a temporary phase he'll be out but on 15th of april suddenly we get a call saying that you know we are finding that the stomach is distended so we might have to do an ultrasound and maybe do another ct right so it was okay we said okay but then uh, 16th morning when they did the ct scan they found that uh, there was a lot of fluid in the abdomen cavity and uh, he has to be rushed to the ot because they even found some fecal matter in the fluid mm -hmm. so then he was rushed immediately to the ot and there uh, 
this time on i mean la till last time till all the surgeries were through that laparoscopic procedures and this time they had to cut open uh, the stomach a big right. uh, 8 9 inch cut was there right and then the ordeal started like so did they tell you at that point that you know it, uh, he will now need a stoma bag uh, nothing, nothing, nothing 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 because when they when they took him to the ot they found that there was a perforation near that reconnecting site right because of which you know they have to again cut the small intestine to uh, yeah. i mean to uh, disconnect and then again they had to bring back the stoma it right. was when he went into the ot he was conscious he was talking to us he was normal as normal as, as normal as can be <laughs> <laughs> but uh, when they brought him out of the ot that was around 5 6 hours later and they took him straight to the icu and they said no no we still have a lot of medical procedures to be done so you can't see him now mm. and then we just kept kept waiting outside then they told us no you go home have your dinner and come back and these things will take a little more time right so when we came back home for dinner and we were just having you know almost finishing our dinner that was when we get a phone call that uh, we are we had to immediately report to the hospital so we rushed and there the doctor says that if uh, there is anybody else in your family apart from you who want to see him hmm. you can call them i said what do you mean by that then he hmm. said no no if anybody wants to see him and because his condition is not good he is not responding his bp has really gone down and uh, we have given the maximum dosage of the two medicines which they give for bringing up the bp right. and he is not responding and that was when i just broke down i mean it was such a sudden i mean such a shock i said this is not possible i mean he is not a sort of guy who just gives up and this is not possible because just 5 hours back we saw him and he was absolutely fine and he was to just have a minor clean up in the abdomen cavity and he was to come out so where did this thing come about but then anyway we three went in me and my daughter and son and when we reached there we found that his was like you know his entire body was bloated up his hands and feet were all cold and uh, you know the size had almost doubled his the size of his uh, hands and feet and he was even going blue at the tips yes. of the fingers and the toes and all so i don't know what where my daughter thought she just sort of went into a you know a kind of a what do you say just she just started talking, started talking. That, papa you just come do this you never uh, you know told us always to fight it out and all that and you can't just you know put up an example like this you have to fight it up and we are there waiting for you so then we noticed that you know there was a slight change in the bp monitor when she was right. talking right so that was when even i and my son joined in mm. and only after that like after he revived and you know whether it was for the talking we did or the medication we are not sure right but then his bp did come up and when it came up to almost uh, 120 then the doctors came and they said okay fine you wait here we'll take over from here hmm. so that was when we came to know that his stoma is now going to be a permanent uh, kind of a thing more or less more till or less. maybe a few months later when the doctors might be able to take care of another reconnecting surgery right right and after you um you know i think he was in the icu and hospital for over a month right that period yeah. uh, with all the complications of as uh, he said uh, about the septic shocks etc um what i mean you said that you know it was uh, uh, repulsive and gross initially that short period so how did you um you know how did you deal with your feelings this time around when they said this may be more long term or possibly permanent as well yeah this time around things were very different because see last time the surgery went off very well and it was like we were in a different kind of a mood but mm. this time around we had almost lost him mm. because every time in the icu we would go to the icu and the verdict would be you know now he is doing a little fine but now he has actually gone down i don't know when we'll be able to revive him back so this was the kind of uh, you know thing going on like a pendulum you know he is right. okay not okay okay not okay and all. so this time around the mental makeup was a bit different 
it was like you know okay fine if he has to live with a stoma bag it's okay right. i mean uh, it was like fine we'll find out with ways and methods of how to you know come out of it and uh, sort of we had sort of accepted that fine right. if the stoma is supposed to be permanent then we are okay with it right right yeah um and, and uh, ramendra ji uh, when you i mean i know throughout all of this when was the point at which you realized that the stoma bag is going to be longer term i always been rather grossed out by you know, when ankita was born by her daughter i told mummy that i'll dance uh, for those days sorry your voice is breaking just a little bit <clears throat> so uh, i have always been uh, grossed out by crap when uh, our right. daughter ankita was born i told madhvi i'll dance to her gurgles i'll sing songs to her i'll tell her stories everything i'll do but i won't clean her uh, her potty so mm. this thing when uh, initially it was like a terrible terrible what should i say uh, extremely traumatic experience during that brief uh, period between the two surgeries but then the hope was always there that it's a temporary phenomena Mm. so i was told after my first checkup post surgery the doctor uh, my onco surgeon said that uh, uh, this time uh, let me make it very clear that this stoma bag is for keeps because mm. we can't take the risk of putting you thing. under a surgeon's knife because it will prove fatal there is mm. uh, no guarantee that you'll survive after what you've gone through so you have to live with it so i was naturally gobsmacked and uh, i raved and ranted and you know i went through the entire what should i say the syndrome of feeling terrible terrible you know because uh, a stoma bag is a complete change in lifestyle in mm. more ways than one uh, on a day to day basis sometimes on, on an hour to hour basis so i gradually got to you know uh, learn to live with it it wasn't easy i mm. had thoughts of uh, any my life i did some uh, research on a foundation called dignitas which is in switzerland which offers assisted suicide but it mm. was beyond me both in terms of geography and economy <laughs> but uh, jokes apart it was a terrible time but uh, once you know i started getting used to the idea i mean i had no choice so then i did some exercise some due diligence mm. and found out a particular apron a bathing apron in which the stoma bag can fit quite snugly so there right. is one more la- uh, layer of protection this gave me the confidence of traveling within the city for some time and then later outside uh, the city also but right. there was one major paradigm shift and i would like uh, madhvi to talk about it when she learned how to replace the stoma bag earlier we used to depend on a male nurse who would come from a distance of an hour or two right until he came i would literally be lying in shit but right. she uh, learned the art the craft and the sheer uh, i mean what should i say the science of and i would uh, like her to talk about it so before you talk about that transition uh, madhvi ji can you talk about you know when from the discharge point right so the moment he was discharged from the hospital uh, how did you figure out uh, how to choose a stoma bag are the sizes types and did you learn more later as well as um, you know what kind of help did you take initially um, at you know at that point of discharge uh, and and then progress to what ramendra ji was talking about learning it as well actually we did a bit of research my son and i and we found out that the stoma bags come in various sizes hmm. at that point of time he had lost a lot of weight Mm. so we ordered the smallest uh, size and uh, that was uh, fitting very nicely and uh, the i mean uh, we had a male nurse come in you know he mm. was a person who used to take care of uh, wounds surgical wounds and the stoma bag so he used to come from a very far off distance so mm. there he had first taught me which was a much easier one apart from the normal stoma bag you have a temporary bag which is not as complicated as the stoma bag which lasts for a few days so mm. he taught me that in case uh, this uh, stoma bag comes off then how to fit that temporary one so mm. that at least that would last uh, him till this guy could uh, come home come over 
right. uh, come over to you know change the bag so from there slowly like i used to keep watching how he was doing it it was a slightly complicated procedure but i think over a period of time i got used to the different steps which he was following so initially it was you know when you remove the stoma bag and you clean the stoma and all that that is uh, still you know i used to get scared because mm. you're not touching the intestine which had come out the stoma that mm. used to scare me mm. but uh, then you know i've watching him over a period of say maybe 6 7 months when he used to keep insisting that madam aap dekho and you the case ke baad aisa karna aise karna see this is why we do this partic- particular step this is why we put this particular cream right. so then slowly after around 7 8 months he used to put me to do and he would watch Hmm. so that way you know he slowly eased me into this uh, uh, entire process of changing the bag so i think uh, i sort of caught on <laughs> right right what is because uh, what i realized now over the last 6 of months and she keep replacing it that she does a far far better job you know, because of the uh, personal involvement and hmm. because she has a head for these things so when earlier this guy would come it would last for say 5 or 6 days but now up to 12 or sometimes even 13 and 14 days the uh, stoma bag lasts and uh, uh, this is a huge shift aparna mm. uh, uh, what can i say it is completely ch- changed uh, my lifestyle now i can i have the courage to not only go for uh, 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 trips within the city but also outside uh, uh right. you know, outside the city we have gone to a couple of uh, trips to bhubaneswar to hyderabad to baroda so this according to me is a, a huge learning from uh, madhvi side which has helped me to a fantastic extent right that point kind of confidence that if at all the bag leaks or if at all there is any other issue i mean we always whenever we travel i carry an entire uh, set with mm. extra bags and the base plate and all that and all the other accessories so right. that as and when because even i would have the confidence that if i have the bag with me in case of any emergency i can get i mean take care of it immediately let me right. give an example on 60th uh, on my 60th birthday we had gone to uh, chikmagalur mm. a tourist resort close by mm. so there it was a very bumpy ride we had gone to a scenic uh, spot so for an hour and a half or almost 2 hours i was practically in mid air it was so bumpy <laughs> so for dinner when i sat down for dinner i suddenly noticed some kind of leakage i rushed to the uh, washroom and i found that the bag had leaked completely Come she was there beside me so within uh, 10 15 minutes uh, she replaced the stoma bag now imagine aparnas had i been there without her mm. uh, so without her expertise and getting help in a remote place like chikmagalur in a tourist resort would have taken possibly 7 8 hours and right. i would uh, be lying in crap all the time mm. See, actually basically this is something which is stuck to the stomach right is, you know there is an adhesive mm. so because of that bumpy ride and his stomach was uh, you know expanding and contracting somehow the adhesive was i mean it sort of gave away so mm. we never thought because uh, something like that so that was also an experience for us it's a reality check a reality check so you know based on these have you learned tips that you would like to share with somebody else right so do you do you add you know do you tie a belt yes. around it do you add an extra adhesive around it so you know things like that how did yeah, you yeah that is there because they do have that apart from the bag itself they they give an adhesive uh, two adhesive strips which mm. can be put around it for uh, safety and he has also you know researched and got hold of an apron which is right. a plastic, uh, plastic kind of thing so on top of that he puts that apron so that is another mm. layer right but basically right. the stomach if it is expanding and contracting there is always the fear that the bag would uh, be loosen out displaced yeah right right yeah right um so i will take a quick moment and show this i think you had shared with us that image so i'll share that and i think karaminder ji if you can also tell us i think i have both images uh, simultaneously uh so if you can also talk about the swimming uh uh contraption that you 
uh, used, right? So, um, hang on. So I, while I'm kind of uh, going through that, yeah, you have one swimwear as well, right? That you have yeah. now started oh, using. Yeah. Uh, swimwear. Uh, yeah. the, the, right one. Uh, the one to the right is the Austrian swimwear, which my son ordered from Spain. So now I tuck my uh, stoma bag into this uh, ostomy swimwear. And then over that, I wear the normal swimming costume. And as a result, I'm able to swim for around 35 to 40 minutes quite easily. Mm. Uh, the stoma bag doesn't get soaked. So right. this is uh, one uh, very, very important breakthrough because I've always been right. crazy about swimming. Mm. The one to the left, the ostomy uh, uh, bath, uh, bath apron, is what I was mentioning. So right. this I use it for a travel. Like if I have to go for a movie or go to a mall, then I encase my stoma bag in this particular uh, bath apron and uh, manage reasonably. Daily bath. And, all for, and also for my daily bath. Right, right. So uh, coming back to, um, you know, how did you get back? I mean, you, you came back after a traumatic experience in the hospital. Uh, you were there for five weeks or so. Um, and most of it was very, very traumatic. Um, what was your state of mind and how did you kind of bring yourself to identify the things that mattered to you and to get, because now you're talking of travel and you're talking of, you know, swimming, etc. right? But how did you get through that phase to get to uh, doing the things that mattered? So it was really, really tough because when I saw my reflection in the mirror, I broke down because I consider myself and I, I hope Madhvi also considers me quite handsome and I had, I had been reduced to just skin and bone. So I really wept for quite, I mean, uh, over a number of days, I was feeling disgusted just looking at my uh, reflection and I was just thinking, would I ever have even a semblance of normalcy returned to me? So during that period, uh, I think after 10 or 12 days, there was, a, a, what can I say, there was some kind of a determination, some kind of a resolve, some kind of resilience that for the sake of my family, the sake of Madhvi, Ankita and Aniket, my kids, our kids, I have to fight it out. And see, the doctors can do so much, they have done it. The family can do so much, they have always been doing it. But now it is up to me. So the first thing I did was to get back to what I'm most passionate about, my writing. So on the 10th or 11th day, I was sitting on my laptop and I started. Hmm. Slowly and steadily, I you know, got more and more involved in my writing, in social media interaction, being in touch with my writer friends. I created a structure. And this structure, I think, was most important for me in getting back uh, to normalcy. And even uh, from that day till today, uh, not a day passes when I do not have a trust with my creativity in some way or the other. So this became really, really important. And as I started going uh, online and then uh, later offline, I started getting a lot of invites for sharing my thoughts, sharing my experience, sharing my family's uh, experience related to cancer. And what I found was that most people don't talk about cancer. Mm. So I wanted to tell people that cancer is a word. It is not a sentence, mm. unintended. And the more I spoke, the uh, greater was the uh, response. I mean, the more enthusiastic was the response from the uh, cancer patients and the caregivers. And uh, I think that kept me going. That kept me motivated. And then I uh, started moving towards creating a more uh, uh, focused writing. Like uh, I wrote my memoir, which is now there with the literary agent. And uh, I'm also working on a book on coping mechanisms, which uh, uh, are more related to the mind than medicines and doctors and hospital treatment. Right, right. So, uh, and at what stage did you say, okay, I'm ready to... Uh, you know, start speaking at events or I'm okay to travel. How did you all figure out that you are able to deal with things like the stoma bag even for travel, right? So because that's something that often people... See, once even... the apron uh, apron I had purchased, 
and uh, once uh, madhvi was okay with the replacing part i think we were ready, we were good to go right. i remember the first thing we did was we saw a movie mm. a, in a theater so that was the first step for uh, neil armstrong you know <laughs> to conquer the moon and then from that it was incremental improvement i remember the first time we went to bhubneshwar uh, i had to take a lot of precaution because uh, you know uh, the flight timing was 2 hours and right. there is there is no jet in the mm. uh, right. washroom of a aircraft right but because the uh, bag was filled up i had to use a uh, use some tissue papers and clean it it was gross but again that was yet another what should i say a small step in getting liberated from this uh, anathema called living with a stoma bag hmm. right so when you travel how do you plan for it what are the things that you look for do you plan for regular breaks do you travel yeah go ahead yeah, till now i think the maximum duration of the flight was 2 hours so uh, the first flight of course he had to use the washroom in the flight Hmm. but uh, after that you know we realized that if he just cleans up before has that uh, imodium tablet which hmm. sort of you know brings down the motility of the intestine and uh, you know he cleans it just before boarding the flight and immediately after getting down so that hmm. those two hours uh, in flight he is able to manage but that's also so not a, a certainty of, uh, because in the recent trip when he had gone to bhubneshwar again despite all the calculations i had to go to the washroom mm. so i have to be prepared so and not only that when i go for my offline sessions i make mm. it very clear to the organizers that i need a clean mm. washroom now right. apart from the definition of a clean washroom in india <laughs> is quite different for different people so mm. yes i have to adjust and sometimes it can get very very gross but mm. then the choices between sitting at home strangled or moving out taking that risk making that uh, extra effort so the choice is always to make that extra effort right if he feels wrong like there's nobody else watching him and it is for him only if he mm. thinks that you know going out is more important right. then automatically a person sort of you know keeps this aside and you know doesn't put too much of focus on that mm. so it does take him a lot of uh, you know planning right before right before you move out anywhere but it's okay that much of adjustment for for instance if my son now says papa let's go for an uh, go out for uh, having an ice cream i have to think a few times mm. because what stage the bag is in uh, when did i have my last meal suppose i get uh, stuck in the traffic in bangalore so i have that apron i clean up i take that uh, apron Uh, and then go for even a simple thing like visit to an ice cream parlor so right. even the small minute things mm. need a lot of planning but so that at the back of the mind is always there but mm. majorly because he wants to get back to the normal i mean somewhat normal life and wants right. to do things which normal people do so i think he is gutsy enough and uh, he is determined enough to you know all these things are definitely there you right, do have right. to plan but you the main thing comes from you know your mental strength right right yeah and you know in terms of um over the period where he because he also lost a lot of weight um and also you have been dealing with uh, things like a stoma are there any diet considerations or tips or anything yeah, that you yeah, have to do yeah you know it with? it comes uh, i mean you can make out even a normal person need not be a doctor mm. like suppose uh, today he is eating a particular thing if it suits him you find that the you know duration of the motion of the this one is quite okay mm. and he doesn't have to go so frequently but mm. suppose something in the meal mm. is not suiting him or hasn't gone well with his uh, system mm. then also you will have this loose motions he'll have more number of motions so this is just that you know you have to be aware of it and you have to just keep noting like in the initial period it took us like whatever he eats we would like to you know correlate mm. like okay what he ate was this 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 and right. this was okay time mm. so mm. that way you know within a few months you know what to how to titrate it and what to uh, you know what 
we should give him to eat and what should be avoided and did you so, do things like keeping a diary on you know food diary yeah, etc yeah, yeah. you did yeah yeah right. we did and that makes things simpler correct that correct makes things simpler right right um and uh, from both of you any other tips for you know the ostomates who are listening to this or for cancer survivors see from my side i would say that the best thing i mean the first thing which you should have is a grit or a determination that i am going to go back to my normal life so mm-hmm. once you have made up your mind all other things you know you will somehow or the other they'll fall in place and you will see for yourself that you know you can go out you can have a uh, quite a normal life right right you, yeah i would like to show a couple of coping mechanisms yeah one thing is that uh, don't take yourself too seriously <laughs> you know if you want to take anything seriously take humor seriously mm-hmm. whether it's a your bum is on the boil or you have a boil on your bum chill man nothing is permanent then uh, uh, develop a passion i think that has really really worked for me so because when you have an interest when you once you have a kind of a very strong ikigai then mm-hmm. those negative thoughts don't intrude into your space and mm-hmm. mess it up so please develop a passion then mindfulness people talk about mindfulness in meditation i found my mindfulness in my writing so i could mm-hmm. focus on my passion my ikigai my writing on a day to day basis and that helped me really really uh, what should i say uh you know recover if i may use the word rather quickly then uh, invest in relationships in this uh, rodent race called life aparna many of us are so uh, you know okay. running in such a weird kind of ways <laughs> that we forget to uh, invest in both online and offline relationships and both matter so uh, let me just share a concept with you called atm you've heard of an uh, automatic teller machine and any time money which is very fond of <laughs> i have created a concept called any time memory so create memories you need only two four letter words love and time hmm. which we all have in plenty but we say we don't so invest in uh, time and love and create memories with your loved ones and right. when you are down and out and cash this atm card because this atm card cannot get lost it cannot get broken and irrespective of the vagaries of the stock market its value will keep rising it will always be priceless diamonds and memories are forever so stock your atm card with nice lovely beautiful memories and when you are down and out please and cash them thanks thanks ramina ji uh madhvi ji um one of the issues we find with caregivers is that they don't get a break right uh, patients somehow do get a break how did you look after your uh, uh, mental health that is very correct that the caregivers uh, you know are more uh, stressed know, out stressed out than the patient but uh, after he i mean we got over that phase where my kids were a big support and for all three of us when he was in the hospital life had sort of just come to a stop stand still it right. was all like you know when do we have to go to the hospital when do we have to come back and what is the next this one not next and so the entire uh, day used to be planned around the hospital trips hmm. and then in in the meantime and we also had to you know shift houses but even then it was that somebody would be there to take care of him so how would the rest of the people you know plan things so planning right. was one very major major aspect of our um, i mean life during that period hmm oh because certain things have to be done so they have to be done right so then you have to work out those things around the hospital trips ensure that he is taken care of he is comfortable and one person if he is staying the night then somebody else has to take over the next day and then mm. that way you know that uh, mm. rot uh, what is rotation that? rotation roster, roster, has roster to and yeah. drawn very properly and right. uh, you should uh, recruit whatever help you can get and mm. that time no inhibitions no this one you know you shouldn't feel because that is the time when you need help and you right. need people because you are stressed out mentally physically everything 
but uh, after we came back home hmm. like things eased up a little bit because we didn't have to make those trips to the hospital so that much right. of time we could save and right. that much of extra sleep we could get and hmm. once this guy started uh, sitting even if it was initially for just 15 minutes when he was sitting there to do his writing or whatever do whatever or maybe hmm. read a book or read so those 15 minutes we just left him alone Right. so we did our thing so mm. then he graduated from 15 minutes to half an hour to one hour to right now he sits for 3 3 and 1/2 hours so right. that time period like for me also it slowly increased so when right. he was busy with his writing i got time to do other things and all and to relax right right so that way it has to be both the patient and the caregiver who have to you know sort of uh, balance correct correct yeah and a follow up question to you ramendra ji because you talked of writing right and one of the issues we've had people talk about as one of the most common uh, post cancer issues is uh, concentration and brain fog right so how did you get back to writing when there is and especially after such a traumatic experience your concentration is uh, uh, affected writing has always been my lifeline you know So right. I think uh, it came naturally to me, and uh, it was my sucker, it was my solace, it was my strength. Apart from, of course, my family. So and 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 I knew that uh, some way or the other, I had to create my own ecosystem. I mean, mm-hmm. I couldn't keep firing on Madhuri and the kids that you know they should spend time with me. And I'm not very fond of watching TV, or I believed in doing something productive because I very strongly believe that a person who doesn't give back to the society. Who's not productive, if I may use the phrase, uh, should not live. You know, I I believe that you should constantly, continually try to give uh, mm. something to the society. So it was a very very strong urge in me to get back to my writing as quickly as possible and with as much focus as possible. And now even today, uh, I've done a little bit of writing, but more I have something. And for over the next three four months, I've already planned what I'm going to do. Right, right. So talking of writing, um, you have written a book recently for which is targeting. I mean, you write children's books in any case, and you've written a book on cancer for children. Can you talk us, you know, about it a little bit? And I'll let me. So just this really book share. is really, really very special. This mm. book was written. This book was written uh, after my cancer. Uh, you know, journey. After mm. I came back from the hospital, I started writing it. The background is uh, uh, about a grandpa who's suffering from cancer and how his connect with his granddaughter helps him uh, re- recover. And I have dedicated this book to all the cancer warriors and their caregivers because I believe that the journey is really, really tough. and sometimes uh, this is one of those rare diseases where the treatment is worse than the malady and i believe that the cancer givers and the uh, sorry the caregivers and the cancer warriors they uh, prove what i have always believed in in the worst of times sometimes the best comes out so let me just uh, read out from the blurb to give our uh, viewers an idea about this very special book and uh, i'm glad to share that Uh, just 24 hours uh, within its launch it was number 1 uh, on hot new releases and number 8 on best sellers in its category on amazon and even yesterday it was pegging at uh, number 5 so this is uh, the blurb isha and her grandpa tatia uh, are besties and share a rare camaraderie tatia is ageless and isha is a girl full of chutzpa when everything seems near perfect tragedy strikes tatia is diagnosed with cancer their world comes crumbling down isha tries to make sense of the chaos around her slowly but surely she becomes a rallying point for her family especially tatia will the daring duo be able to overcome the huge crisis in the worst of times can it bring out the best within can it fight the big Humor with bigger humor. My grandpa, my bestie is a story of courage, compassion, and empathy with loads of musty and humor. It tells an enduring tale 
of an endearing connect between Gen X and Gen Next. Thank you. Thank you. So it definitely sounds like a very uh, you know, interesting book and a useful book because I don't think we have too many books uh, in the country uh, targeting children to understand what's happening with uh, you know family members getting cancer. So I think uh, thank you for writing this book and you know talking about it as well. Um, I think a couple of uh, questions uh, before we wind up, and I know we've taken a fair amount of your time. Uh, to both of you, what has been the most difficult part of this journey? And what keeps you going? Madhvi? Uh, it usually happens, like he said, when you are, uh, I mean, during the rest of your times, I mean, when tragedy strikes, it takes away quite a bit from you. I mean, that is something which you never expect. And nobody expects that, you know, cancer will hit them. Mm. So coming to terms with that, your uh, children coming to terms with that, and then all of us rallying around him, trying to motivate him because he is the affected person. He is the one most, uh, you know, what do you say? Impacted. impacted. So that is the kind of, uh, you know, time when we have to forget our own, uh, you know, problems or stress levels or strain or whatever and rally around him. And if even if one of us is down, I think the rest should just, you know, come around to pull him out of it. After mm -hmm. that, again, we can come back to our normal life and all. So that has been the, you know, kind of way we connect to each other. That even if one is down, all three are, you know, rallying around the that person that to bring person. him out of it. And then again, life goes on. So that was uh, one thing which we did. And... Uh, for his part, he had a lot of grit. He was so, so, so full of courage that it became easier for us to help him. Right, right. Ramendra? So I have had a very tough uh, childhood, you know. Mm -hmm. I am a suicide survivor at the age of 15. My parents separated. They got divorced when I was 16. I suffer from an ailment called brittle diabetes when the sugar levels go from the low of 46 to a high of 512 within... 12 to 13 hours. Uh, I also suffer from a disease called silent thyroiditis where the thyroid levels swing. I had uh, a very critical throat surgery performed uh, on me in 2016. And uh, uh, I mean, I could have uh, been uh, late Ramendra Kumar. It was that uh, critical uh, uh, operation. And uh, I've been, you know, fighting the slings and arrows of outrageous fortune, as the poet said, throughout my life. So, and my mantra, like I've shared before, has always been fighting every tumor with humor. And in this case mm -hmm. also, I think I went back to my mantra, went back to my basic, uh, uh, what should I say, my basic resilience, which I think I've got from my father. He has always been a great source of inspiration and strength to me because he had the toughest of lives. And he fought every day, every moment with the same resolve, which I try to emulate. And for me, a huge, huge thing was the family. Aparna, you, uh, the youngsters today, most of the time, they give you logistic support. The best hospitals, right. the best care, the best doctors, the best treatment. They don't give their time and energy. In my case, our children kept their lives on hold for those few months. They were always around their papa. And uh, they were, literally, they stopped living. And along with Madhvi, the three of them I cannot tell you the kind of, she talks about my courage. I should talk about their courage. Throughout mm. this chaos that was happening all around us, not even once did they press the panic button or allow me to feel the kind of hell I was traversing on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. I think that was my real, real strength. My family and, of course, the support of both my online and offline friends. And together, I think we created an ecosystem of positivity. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, so I think uh, on that note, I would like to thank both of you. And I think as we've learned today from uh, listening to and talking to uh, Madhvi ji and Ramendra ji is that, you know, and I know people and even Ramendra ji said it, that cancer treatment is worse than cancer. But I think I would like to correct that because, you know, if 
treatment is something that helps you live after and you know it gives you the opportunity to rebuild life after uh, cancer as well and i think both of you have shown how you can persevere and you know restore and rebuild your life and adapt to a life after cancer after a stoma bag and uh, you know uh, i think it's important to uh, because people often scared get scared away in the case of cancer from treatment so we do want to emphasize that and i think as both of them have said there is no there is no two ways about the fact that you need determination and you need support of your loved ones i think th those are critical ingredients to uh, restoring uh, quality of life uh, after any critical illness especially cancer apart from all of the you know medical uh, uh, and the uh, you know innovations and treatment options out there so yeah, thank you. I would just like to add, Abhana, that you're absolutely right. Treatment is tough. There's no doubt about it. It's scary. Mm. But I would advise everybody to go in for it. And with as much resolve and grit like you mentioned. Finally, I would like to say that don't wait for the light at the end of the tunnel. Rush forward, grab it, and make it your own. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you once again, uh, Ravindraji and Madhviji. And um, I think we will, I, I'm sure this conversation will help a lot of people who are struggling with, uh, uh, you know, cancer as well as with uh, things like stoma. We, as I said, in the, in the announce, after the announcement we made, we had people reaching out and saying that, you know, their loved ones chose not to, and therefore it's really important. And thank you so much for stepping up to share this uh, experience and everybody shies away from this because of you know as both of you have said there is a certain level of grossness involved there is a certain level of repulsiveness uh, but it is I think we just have to accept that it is a natural body function and we you know we just have to learn to live with it and there are now tools and technologies and uh, solutions available so uh, again thank you so much for talking about it uh, as well thank you thank, thank you so much, much.